Welcome everyone, what a wonderful crowd and um, it's amazing to see such a full house. Um, we'll go ahead and get started then. Welcome so much to this opening event in our spring term policy and practice series. Tonight's event is entitled Wartime Diplomacy, Perspectives from a British Ambassador to Ukraine. Tonight's event is jointly hosted by UCL's Department of Political Science and also our UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies, or CIS. My name is Julie Norman. I'm an Associate Professor of Politics and International Relations here at UCL. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening. Um, and before I introduce our wonderful speakers, just let me say two <laughs> quick things. Um, first, you're all in luck, this being the first policy and practice of the uh, new semester. This one will be followed by a drinks reception over in the political science department after the talk. We hope many of you will come and join us, continue the conversation, catch up with friends, and have a bit more chat with our speakers. And um, we'll go further details on that at the end of the talk, but it will be over in the political science building off Gordon Square. Second, if you haven't already, please do take a look at our other forthcoming events for this term. Um, I'll be hosting next week's event also on Israel-Palestine, and we'll have other events through the term on um, data-driven campaigning, China's economic policy, net zero policies, and many other uh, politics and policy topics. To find those details, please look online to book your place. You can go to the events section of the UCL Department of Political Science website. So back to this evening, um, we are focusing this special event on the war in Ukraine, of course. We're delighted to welcome Dame Melinda Simmons, um, who is the UK's ambassador to Ukraine from September 2019 to August 2023, so not even quite six months ago. Her distinguished career in the British Foreign Service has included positions in the Department for International Development, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and the National Security Secretariat. So we're so delighted to have you. Thank you. We're also delighted to welcome uh, Amy Ferris Rotman. Amy is a global news editor at the Washington-based New Lines magazine, which is excellent, an excellent publication, where she oversees coverage of the war in Ukraine. She's also reported on the war and on Russia's invasion for Time magazine. This followed almost a decade of reporting in Russia and the former Soviet space, most recently as Moscow correspondent for the Washington Post. It's fitting that we're co-hosting this event tonight with our colleagues at CIS because both of our speakers have a CIS connection. Dame Melinda is now an honorary professor at CIS and Amy is a CIS alumna, having completed both her bachelor's and her master's degree there in Russian studies. So, um, so a nice shout out for CIS. Um, I'll hand over in just a moment to Amy who will engage Dame Melinda in a conversation for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll open the floor up to your questions. Just before that, let me just say this whole event, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be posted online afterwards on our website and YouTube channel and also our podcast. That means that if you speak, you will be heard in the recording. If you don't speak, you will not be heard in the recording. Um, we will let you know when the recording is available and hope that you will share it with others. So I'll now turn it over to Amy to get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Great, well, it's wonderful to see you all here. There's so many people, this is brilliant, um, which is testament, of course, to, to how big a story it is um, and how much interest there is in Ukraine and, of course, in Dame Melinda's experience. So today is day 687 of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, um, a war which see, unfortunately sees no signs of abating. The year began with horrific violence um, inflicted by Russia. And I wanted to begin with your, with your personal experience, Dame Melinda, because you're quite unusual, if I, if I may say, um, well, but in the sense from other ambassadors of major allies like the United States and the European Union, in that your posting began way before this invasion started. Obviously, there were issues in the East. Um, but could you please tell us a bit about what your first day of your posting was like and what your last day was like? What, what changed on the ground? For you, um, what you saw. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. I'm terribly sorry, those of you who are having to sit on the floor, sort of feel quite humbled by it, actually. But uh, thank you, anyway, for the opportunity. 
Um, actually, uh, half of the G7 ambassadors arrived at the same time in uh, anywhere between July and sort of October 2019. So I wasn't quite good company. But what I remember about my first day is that I asked somebody where Chancery was in the embassy because I uh, didn't have a straight diplomatic career. I'd been in DFID, I'd worked elsewhere. Uh, even when I'd worked in the Foreign Office, I'd not worked in an embassy. This was actually my first time in an embassy. So I remember on day one asking where Chancery was and being told that I was standing in it. So I was in a quite low bar when I first started, just trying to work out how an embassy functions. And of course, by the time I left, I knew how it worked. So that was probably the biggest difference. As for, um, as for how my last day differed from my first, well, I just felt very grateful to be in the embassy at all, actually, because we had all evacuated in January of the previous year. Most people had gone. I stayed until uh, only about three days before Kiev came under attack. And I was really not sure I'd see Kiev again. So the truth is actually that every day after I came back in April 22, every day was a day when I felt grateful to Ukrainians for being able to do my work um, where I was supposed to be. That was probably the biggest difference between arriving and leaving. And you were there, I mean, you've seen the war up close, the ongoing war. Um, you did quite a lot of travel. Um, it, during your posting, relayed the situation there to Britain, to the world. Um, could you tell us a bit about what you witnessed in terms of how Ukrainianness is being deliberately attacked? The culture, the language, the history. Well, so I think that uh, where I interacted with Ukraine even before I arrived, that was already a thing. For example, um, I learned Ukrainian before I went to Ukraine. And that was stressful enough because in stark contrast to now, actually, there are very few resources for learning Ukrainian. I learned Ukrainian off two apps and a dictionary that had been produced in 1952 or something. Terrible resources for learning Ukrainian. But I learned from uh, one of my teachers was deeply committed, um, uh, deeply committed to her job, passionate about the language. And I remember learning some words, you know, just kind of the initial words. I remember learning word for car, and then maybe a month later, she told me I couldn't use that word anymore. It was too Russian. I had to use new word. Uh, it was this word, which is flipping stressful when you only have eight months to learn the language <laughs> anyway. But, uh, and that kept happening. So I was learning a language that was already deliberately propelling itself to um, cut away from Russian and more deliberately use Ukrainian uh, language words. So I had a sense of being part of a progression anyway, uh, a sense of a more... Um, clearly articulated Ukrainian this before I went there. And, you know, you alluded to uh, a situation in the East, but you just ask any Ukrainian, and there are many in this room, that wasn't a situation in the East, that was an invasion that then became a comprehensive invasion in February of last year. That's what it was. It wasn't a small thing, Donbass being under occupation, Crimea being taken. So that had already propelled uh, a stronger sense of national identity. It didn't need last year to happen. Um, for that to continue. What became more apparent, certainly when people started to visit Butcher, and I was among the first ambassadors to go to Butcher, that, that was when I think it became clear that Ukrainianness was coming under attack. And not just because of those terrible pictures and footage of people with their hands behind their backs or someone on their bicycle who'd been shot. Actually, as, as terrible as that was, I went to that mass grave before it had been covered over and that was hard enough to take, but interestingly, uh, what I was struck more by on this theme was that I was taken to a trade center, a business center that was on the outskirts of Butcher, and there was a culture museum that had been located just opposite it, and it had been blasted to bits. And I asked the mayor, when did that happen? He said it was the first thing they did. So um, I think it was the first time I, I, it wasn't the first time I thought that civilians were being targeted. After all, when I came back, I drove along the Chitomia Road to Kiev and every house, every cinema, school, playground, clinic had been hit by tank fire. And none of that was military installations. The whole of that woodland was felled and trees were hanging off their trunks. It was perfectly clear that people were coming under attack. It wasn't just about two militaries engaging. But it was Butcher when I thought about museums being targeted deliberately uh, next to seeing how people were being lined up and shot. You got a clearer sense that it wasn't just people as, as ultimate as that was, it was Ukrainian identity that was also being targeted in a very considered 
one by the invasion. The culture, as well as its statehood, economy, uh, one of the things, and it's interesting that you said that about the apps and, and the lack of resources. Um, I would love to know what, well, that's a discussion for a later time, but I'd love to know what resources are out there now because well, interest it's huge is... Loads more. Mm. It's wandering into foils. There's a whole flipping wall of it. I can't believe it. I never used to be able to find Ukrainian language books in foils or anyone else. You had to kind of pry among the Russian and you might find something somewhere in there. Now it's got its own whole wall. That's what the invasion has done. So that brings me to my next question, which is the reverse, or not the reverse, but the in the face of such aggression and deliberate attack on, on Ukrainian culture, it, it appears, and m many of the stories that we've covered at New Lines magazine has been about U the Ukrainian, what well, Ukrainian culture fighting back um, and coming back in a huge way. Um, so you talked about the books in foils, but what, what was that like in Kyiv? What did that look like? Well, I, I mean, I guess I experienced it most this really in terms of how much less Russian um, mm. I was hearing on the streets. So I did my language immersion in uh, Kyiv. I was uh, sent in May 22 to stay with a family who lived in a high-rise block um, somewhere near Zoloty Vorota. And um, they, I was sure that they would speak Ukrainian, and they did, they spoke Ukrainian to me. They spoke Russian to each other, though. So <laughs> if I was trying to, you know, absorb Ukrainian as, a, as an instinctive language, I, sure, I certainly didn't get that experience. And I remember feeling I'd really arrived when I'd been there a year, and I was walking down the road, and a woman came over to me and asked me for directions somewhere. And I gave her directions in Ukrainian, and, and uh, then she walked off one way and I walked off the other. And it's only about 10 minutes later I realised she'd been speaking to me in Russian. I'd answered her in Ukrainian. It wasn't that my Ukrainian had got better, it's that my passive Russian had got better. Um, because that was the way people interacted in Kiev. You either spoke Russian or you spoke Ukrainian. <coughs> Nobody made a particularly big deal about either. But what I really noticed when I came back to Kiev, and frankly, Kiev was a pretty much a ghost town when I first came back to it in April, but as people came back, and as uh, families, bit by bit, came back, although there are still many of them not back in Kiev. But as they began to, I just didn't hear Russian um, in the streets anymore. And I never had that experience again, uh, even as I was walking around and meeting people, of hearing Russian and answering in Ukraine. The active switch that went yeah, on. Yeah, there'd been an active switch. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, my next question is, well, is, is much darker, sadly, than language. Um, but it is to do a lot with your previous work before you were ambassador. You focused a lot on, on crimes uh, of sexual violence during wartime. And that has obviously, as we know, continued, well, continued in the world, um, in Ukraine, committed by Russia. There's been widespread sexual violence carried out against women and girls. And if you could, could you tell us a bit about what you see using your experience is Russia's motivation in, in doing this or why subjugating women and girls is such um, a, a key part of, of invading a country, another sovereign state? Well, um, I focused on uh, preventing sexual violence because my career and particularly those last few jobs before I went to Ukraine were focused on conflict prevention and resolution and um, sexual violence against women and girls, and not just women and girls, but particularly women and girls, uh, is a weapon of war. And that was the campaign that uh, I was working on at that time, was to try to highlight it as such mm. uh, and make it clear that this wasn't some incidental thing. And I think, I'm sorry to say that Russia, in that regard, was, was it was straight playbook. It was more of that. Um, and it wasn't just, and continues not just to be, a few drunken soldiers just kind of, you know, losing it pretty well organized, actually. The incidents of rape that people would speak to and um, sexual violence in Ukraine is quite a taboo subject, getting women to talk about this. Um, even before the war, the UK was one of the countries mostly involved, actually, in supporting efforts to try to reduce domestic violence. Domestic violence prevalence in Ukraine, really off the charts, um, compared worldwide, actually, one of the highest incidents of sexual violence in Ukraine. And a lot of it um, reportedly was coming about as a result of uh, PTSD, all those people serving in the East and then coming back to their families and very little by way of mental health care for them, but not just actually. It's a patriarchal society with all kinds of misogyny that is pretty rife about uh, expectations of women in the marriage, in the home, huge pressure uh, for them to give up work, to marry early, give up work, have kids. I actually remember speaking to young diplomats um, 
in my first year and about my career. And it was all very interesting. They had loads of questions. But the first question I was asked by a young girl who was maybe 23 years old, the first question was, did you ask your husband for permission before you applied for this job? Which uh, I was uh, really taken aback by that question. Mm. I'd never been asked that question before ever. And I think she was just as gobsmacked by my reply, which was, I asked him if he could handle cold weather, but that was about the extent of the conversation. <laughs> uh, and he said he wasn't keen, so I bought him a puffer jacket and we were good to go. But um, never ever did it occur to me to ask him for permission in terms of designing my career. We would have a conversation about where in the world we might want to mm. be together, but there was never that conversation. So, you know, that was in 2020. You're still having uh, a conversation in a country where girls feel they've got to get that sign off. So that means all things are unequal in that relationship. And that means that there's quite a lot of violence against women in Ukraine, that pre-war was just being taken as something you had to pay a price for mm -hmm. in your marriage or, you know, on the streets. And you certainly didn't talk about rape. So if you like my engagement and those of other women ambassadors actually who got involved with this, I'm sorry that it was just women ambassadors, but it was. But we did a lot of work on it was as much to try to help create an environment where what had happened to uh, women and girls in those occupied parts of Ukraine was something that they felt able to talk about. As it was helping the prosecutor general to gather those crimes and to take a step back and look at the patterns. Both were important for obvious reasons. Those um, reports are now in their thousands, which leads me to believe, of course, that they almost certainly exist in their hundreds of thousands. So uh, I'm sorry to say that I think it's probably a central uh, part of the hybrid engagement in this war as... Um, you know, shooting at museums and stopping people from speaking Ukrainian, etc. Unlike other conflicts, um, the rape and sexual violence of, of women in Ukraine got enormous attention. I mean, which is wonderful. Attention in the press. That, I mean, as a journalist, I can tell you that's super unusual. I mean, the, it was the reports that were coming out um, the, the interest in it, the fact that it was seen to be taken at face value. I mean, that's so rare. And uh, from what I gathered speaking to advocates, um, women's rights advocates, this was, of course, a good thing, obviously. But cautious. It was a, it, there was cautious optimism because it seems to have almost entirely petered out. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I'm a journalist, so I, I think it might, you know, am I part of the problem? But... Um, um, and I understand that journalism does play a role in this and wants to keep stories hot and, 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 and in, in focus and make them interesting. But, but why, as an expert in this, did it peter out beyond journalists using the news cycle? So I, there is a thing where journalists have a responsibility. And mm. um, Christina Lamb's last piece on this in the Sunday Times is worth a read because uh, it, it, she had written repeatedly, and in fact she has through her whole career, about sexual violence in war. And she wrote her third piece, I think it was, about it in Ukraine. But actually, the tone of that piece was, I'm sick of writing this and nothing ever happens. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you don't have journalists who want to write about this. It's what happens within those publications that says this is a thing that we want to make mm. uh, a centerpiece of the story. That, historically, you know, has rarely happened. And uh, it's failing to happen here. So those publications carry that responsibility. But also, when it, was, when it first came out, you know, what you look for collectively is a solution. So the solution was you uh, fund ICC prosecutors, International Criminal Court prosecutors, and you help the prosecutor general and you find the box to put it in. And once you've put your resources that way, you know, let's go look for something else. I mean, after all, it was one of several things that Russians were doing to Ukrainians. The Brits, along with everyone else, had to look at how energy supplies were being disrupted and grain supplies were being disrupted, had to look at military support, had to look at humanitarian support. 17 different things you have to look at. Inevitably, institutions look for a solution that just says, right, I've done what an institution needs to do for this. We can, we can move on. And uh, it's inevitable. It's just inevitable about institutions. So it's got lost in the sense that it's been put in its box. And uh, it's a struggle to pull it back out and make sure people understand um, the nature of how people are still being targeted. And that's one of the ways in which they're being targeted. So it's the responsibility of the press as well as... To build on the story. Yeah. Um, and, keep it. and it's the responsibility of people who will, after all, are what institutions comprise, mm. to um, be continuing to work quite hard to argue for its, uh, for, for, um, for its exposure. Um, and uh, as you may have noticed, we've had you know, 
quite a high turnover of ministers over the course of the war. So actually, every new minister is an opportunity to bring the story back out and um, be talking again about where mm. we're at now compared to you know three, six months ago, what now needs to be done. Connected to this, um, well, the subjugation of, um, of women and girls is also the abduction of children, which is also a war crime. Um, and uh, the president of Russia, Putin, bloody, <laughs> it's, it's rare to be, uh, anyway, I, uh, there's certain rooms where it's best not to even mention him, but um, I think this is one of those rooms. So that, you know, that guy, um, the president of Russia. Ultimate. Yes, <laughs> um, exactly. Um, but it is wanted by the International Criminal Court for the abduction of children, as is his um, children's ombudsman, the great irony of that. Um, and according to Ukraine's current count, I think it's almost 20,000 children, they believe, have been abducted by Russia. And um, I mean, yeah, well, what did you, what was your engagement with this? Um, and Well, I went to see their um, Commissioner for Human Rights, um, who was someone I would call on regularly. And uh, in fact, he asked to see me and that was the first time I was briefed on the extent of it. Mm. So uh, I'd heard, of course, about some of it but uh, the Ukrainians had been collating cases. Um, and so, of course, I, I mean, I reported it, as, as all embassies would do, reported back to the UK. But um, we were really good at the embassy in Kiev at enabling people's stories to be told. So this wasn't just about reporting back to the UK, but trying to give people a platform to uh, tell the diplomatic community what was happening to them. There were representatives of countries in Kiev who would... Um, who would uh, not really want to hear it. So, uh, so we thought a good way to try to give that platform was to create something very informal, which we did in my residence. And we invited women who had been uh, sexually assaulted or women whose um, fighting partner, husband had been killed in captivity and, or whatever. Um, someone who had been picked up and uh, was now free to tell us their stories. Quite a lot from the first phase, actually, people who'd been taken to those filtration camps who then would tell us what exactly happened in that filtration process. Very, very hard for people to do that, uh, both because, you know, to feel safe enough to tell the story, but also to relive it is, uh, for every single one of them, appalling. And we did bring children to um, my residence in a kind of forum that looked a little bit like this, only with tea and coffee in a place you could go to if you just couldn't stand to hear this anymore, because every story was hard. And uh, in so doing, we, we gave that oxygen. So every mm. diplomat who came would obviously go back, file a report that says, uh, whatever it is, our government line is, here's the story that I heard from these people. So I also called on Mikola Kuleba, who has a charity called Save Ukraine that I'm sure some of you have heard of. And uh, that is um, a charity entirely de dedicated to helping those children come back. And also uh, he runs psychosocial care for them. And I went to that place with James Cleverly, actually. And uh, we spoke to some of those children. The thing is, 20,000 is a, is a terrible number. But she only needs to speak to one, one of them to hear just how uh, terrifyingly well-organized and planned that abduction process is from the point of taking a child to uh, the experience, the kind of stages that they go through um, once they're uh, in one of those camps. Only one, really, both to understand that, mm. uh, that scale and that planning, but also the challenge that Ukraine now has, not just in getting them back, but in that generation of traumatized kids. Um, so uh, I don't, honestly, just to call that a war crime, an atrocity is to reduce it, really, mm. um, in the sense of trying to get those kids back in every way, in reprogramming brains, not just you know, bringing them physically back to their parents, which is hard enough to do. I mean, some would say, it, and the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has said it's genocide and that it's... He has, I think, said that, yes. Yeah. Would, would you agree with that or that... Is this Do you not... know, I think uh, that uh, the experience, not just of Ukraine, but also of October 7th and since, shows that we bandy around the word genocide far too easily. Mm. Um, I, uh, I don't... I, mean, I have my own, you know, background that means that I think about genocide, but I think it's for the courts to decide that. Well, I, I really do. That's mm -hmm. what it is. It's sure. a legal engagement and the courts need to decide. But what I do think um, we all should be doing, in, and what, of course, the UK has done alongside other governments, 
is to be encouraging everything that needs to be done to pass over mm. those allegations and make sure that they're properly, uh, properly investigated. I have, including on social media, if you were following me on social media when I was there, quite frequently said, I've seen this thing and this looks like it needs investigating mm. as a war crime and gone as far as uh, saying that. But I don't think it's for me to be uh, adding to that pool sure. by telling people what kind of engagement this is. It's certainly been, as you said, it was, it's very well organised, very effective in traumatising a whole country. And it's been really brazen. I mean, some children have appeared on Russian state television and parents have recognised them. Um, living parents, not that being an orphan is an excuse to be abducted, but um, Yeah, but it's a paper that, goes back, that goes back decades, longer, mm. really. Isn't, um, if anything, uh, if anything, it's more to do with the fact that collectively we've all taken our eye off this particular ball. And for decades, not really mm. um, politically looked at those things. You know, what happened even kind of pre-Second World War and how that has formed Russia's relationship with Ukraine is really pertinent for now. We didn't do that. So all this looks kind of, all of, all of this is obviously terrible, but none of it is actually novel. It's the most dramatic by far um, of those assaults on Ukraine. But there's nothing there that wasn't tried before by previous, um, previous regimes and previous engagements. You mentioned pre-World War II and, and your, um, your own connection to Ukraine. And I think that's a good point to talk about your personal connection. Also something I believe we share. We both have Ukrainian Jewish roots. Um, that's certainly what drew me to the region um, and, and why I wanted to visit Ukraine as a young CIS student, which I, I did. And I remember taking a, a boat from Crimea to, um, to Odessa, where my great grandparents are from, and you know, the sun was coming out. And, um, and I saw, saw, t saw it and thought, oh, well, actually, I think I'm British. Because like, I just suddenly thought, oh, I was going to be like, I'm home. Um, but that didn't, it didn't happen, um, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but the interest in in Ukraine stayed, and I, I believe you are similar. You also are um, you have Ukrainian Jewish roots. Is that what drew you to the country? Is that why you wanted to be the ambassador there? Well, only a small part actually, because uh, my family, my ancestors, left Ukraine in the eighteen nineties, which is far too long ago, really, for uh, us to have same with me, yeah, to, to have much um, sense of identity. Uh, I did actually, growing up, eating things like borscht, but I had no idea it was Ukrainian. And actually, it's not Ukrainian, uh, I will tell you. Um, I know this because about a year and a half into my posting, my communications guy said, you eat borscht, it'd be really great if you could make borscht with, um, with this very well-known chef, because that's a Ukrainian dish. Tell me what recipe your mum used to use. So I told him the recipe. He was aghast. He said, that is not borscht. And I said, well, well, she called it borscht the whole time I was growing up. Turned out it was Polish borscht, not Ukrainian borscht. The idea of making borscht was quietly dropped. There was no way I was going on TV to make a Polish borscht. So there you go. A very strong sense of identity around food. I had no idea that uh, I, was, I was eating food from Eastern Europe. My family fled anti-Semitism. And when you, flee, uh, when you flee oppression, what you want to do is make it possible, as, as possible as possible, for that, for that not to be um, part of what you stand out for, if you like. So there was no sense of, you know, the glorious, you know, place they'd come from. Mm. They'd run. That was it. That was the end of their, their engagement with that story. And, of course, not all of them ran. Everybody else who stayed was killed. So I didn't ever have that, you know, I'm home or I'm Ukrainian. I was, however, deeply interested because what I have in common with many British Jews is a massive hole in our mm -hmm. history as well. We don't actually know. Most of us don't know. Not least, of course, because Soviet occupation meant decades of, you know, no real information, quite a lot of disinformation about what happened to Jews in that region. Um, I was interested to see if I could find out. So that, if you like, was where my, uh, the, an added reason, but it wasn't the only reason for wanting to go. I've long been interested in Eastern Europe as a place to be. Mm. And did you seek to find out what happened to your family? Or? Yeah, I did. So my family was from uh, Kharkiv, and that's about all I knew apart from a very extraordinary personal story about how they got to the UK, but that's probably for another time. But um, uh, I tried archives, but uh, they had looked as if they'd, they'd never actually registered anything, no births, no deaths. So um, that was a dead end. So I figured, actually, I'd probably never find out. But there was something that I did whenever I traveled anywhere. It didn't matter where I went in Ukraine, there were two things I always did. 
I always visited the synagogue if there was one or if there was a community that was meeting. If they didn't have the synagogue, didn't matter, I would go and meet them. And I would always go to the killing site because practically everywhere in Ukraine, mm. every village, every town, every city, there is a killing site where uh, principally Jews, not just Jews, but principally Jews were killed during the Second World War. So when I went to Kharkiv, I went to this fantastic community. It was the most beautiful synagogue, lots of children and lots of elderly people and energetic community workers, and it was really lovely. And uh, after I had gone to that, I went to Drobitsky Yar, which is about half an hour outside Kharkiv. It's a ravine where uh, something like 11,000 Jews were shot in 1941, and I figured it would be a symbolic visit. But it had something that nowhere else had at the time. It had information. It wasn't just a memorial. Mm. It was the most beautiful memorial at the time, actually, a white arch, and then a kind of walk that was lined with trees down to where people had been shot. And under the white arch, there were steps. If you went into the steps, there was a little museum with a memory wall of people's names. Someone, a philanthropist, had funded for collecting of as many names as people as possible of people who had been killed at Drobitsky Yard. So I found my family name on that wall. It was the most extraordinary moment. I had quite an unusual family name. And uh, I was there with two other people from work. And they were kind of walking around and looking. And then I froze in front of this name and um, could not believe that I, I might have found the place where my family's story had ended. Wow. So I took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I was back in Kiev, I told my mother, it's my mother's family. Most interesting thing about my mother's reaction was how happy she was. She was so happy. It's not, you, you would always have known, of course, that uh, they had died because there was never any evidence of family anywhere else. It was knowing, mm. it was having history for the first time, of understanding now yeah. what had happened was, uh, she was almost triumphant about it. Closure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was the name? If, if I, may uh, ask. I won't share that. Oh, well, okay, no, no worries at all. Um, we've also got some quite strange names. Um, well, it doesn't exist anymore, yeah. the other, because it all anglicizes mm. itself. But. Um, I mean, with this background, and which is fascinating for me, obviously, because I share it, but also because it's unique. Um, and that's, I don't just say that because I share it. Um, but um, no, it, it is unique because Russia has explicitly used this false claim that Ukraine is full of Nazis um, to, to justify its invasion and continued presence um, there. And the great irony in this, of course, is that Zelensky is Jewish. Um, and so, uh, and this is an interest, well, it's a, it's a point of uh, continued, well, somewhat contention because um, on the one hand, you've got this Jewish leader, um, openly Jewish leader, and on the other hand, you've got Russia saying they're going to crush these Nazis, and then you've got people like the far Russia's foreign minister, Lavrov, saying, um, awful things when he, I mean, he compared Zelensky to Hitler and then created the whole, um, saying Hitler was also Jewish. Anyway, so, but my, my point here is, is Russia using anti-Semitism as well? Well, it is. We know it is as well. Um, so on the one hand, they're saying they're Nazis, but they're also using anti-Semitism to put down Zelensky. Um, and how did you, what did you witness on this front? And... Who was um, who was leading that? Obviously Russia, but who within Russia? Um, I think it's impossible to tell. Well, it's certainly mm. impossible to tell for me. You'd have to ask our colleagues in Moscow for, for points well, on where well, it might be. Well, they won't answer. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. So I, would, I, uh, uh, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't tell you from Ukraine. But of course, I did, you saw plenty of it. Mm. The Russian embassy in the UK in 22 tweeted out a picture of Zelensky with a hooked nose. Mm. Actually, they were the only embassy in the world to do that. They were not the only embassy to tweet out anti-Semitic stuff. But that cartoon was only published in the in the UK, um, and the hook nose picture of Zelensky was a very popular one um, inside uh, inside Russia. There were other things. There were comments, Lavrov's comments, for example, you know, alleging that Jews supported Hitler, etc. There were some terrible, terrible things. But those uh, those um, what looked like contradictory narratives seemed to me to be perfectly comfortable inside Russia that they would promote either one or the other. It didn't make any difference. What I think. Um, and I did used to out them. I used to talk about them. I used to mm -hmm. um, call them what they were. I thought what was much more interesting was how Ukraine understood mm. um, anti-Semitism inside its country. That was a really difficult conversation to have inside Ukraine. Really difficult. There would be interesting, and particularly after I visited Kharkiv for the first time, interesting moments and in interviews that I would do 
where, where people had always been very excited to ask about my Ukrainian roots and would say, your family came from Kharkiv, that's so fantastic. What happened to them? And I would say, well, obviously my family left. Mm. Everyone else was killed in the Holocaust. And then there would be like a half second beep. And then the interviewer would say, tell me about the trade agreement. You know, there would never be a follow up. There would, yeah. there would never ever would there be, I'm sorry even, or where did that happen or, uh, or anything actually. So, uh, and it took me about a year uh, of doing those interviews to start to push it a little bit myself. Mm. If you like, kind of leave it open for a guide and interviewer towards a point of saying, what do you think happened there? Or, you know, how do you feel about that? And of course, part of it is because the narrative does include Ukrainians who participated in it. Yep. And it's incredibly hard. It would have, was hard enough pre-war. In fact, I remember one of my own teachers, language teachers, when I had this conversation uh, with her saying, you, you can't talk about that. If you talk about that, Russians will use it as fuel um, in their narrative that Ukrainians are anti-Semites, so you mustn't use that narrative. Mm -hmm. And what I started to say after my first year there was, a strong country that's pursuing a democratic future is able to um, acknowledge what's happened. Right. That's all you're asking here, to acknowledge the truth, the reality of what happened, and it doesn't weaken you to do that. On the contrary, it makes you stronger and it makes your country truly inclusive to do that. So that was the, that was the narrative that I started to pursue for the time that I was there. But then when the invasion took over and Ab Babin Yar was hit, albeit it looked like accidentally mm -hmm. by a missile that was directing itself to the TV station, and then actually Drobitsky Yar was, was hit, took a direct hit from a missile attack in Kharkiv. Uh, then actually the whole conversation about how Jewish heritage in Ukraine was being, um, was being attacked, I didn't need to engage. There were enough people out there who were seeing this and calling it what it was. I think, yeah, we probably should turn to questions, but that's a fascinating point to end on, which is a future looking point, of course, which is how, yes, how does Ukraine reconcile with its own past in order to move forward? So Dame Melinda, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been an extraordinarily rich conversation already, and we're happy to open it up now for audience questions. Um, I might take a couple at a time. Um, I'm not sure if we're, are we attempting moving mic or is it uh, yeah, like tossing mic? Um, I see one, two, three, um, and we'll start with these three. So the gentleman here. Thank you for an interesting debate. Uh, as an Irishman, I've got two short questions. Uh, Paul has been brought up in County Kerry to be very highly respectful and admiring the British Foreign Office. So I would like to ask why this meeting this evening, the questions and answers are so highly Russophobic, making allegations about Bucha, that Russia has, could you please, the first question is, why has Britain and the US not agreed to the Russian request for an independent investigation into Bucha? My second question is, why the British Foreign Office, we had a foreign secretary who told Sergei Lavrov, who by the way is Jewish, if Zelensky is Jewish, you cannot say that, uh, claim this is being anti-Semitic. The Russian foreign minister is Jewish. Sergei Lavrov is a Jew and he's very proud of it. Did you not know that? Yes, I knew that. I don't uh, thank you. Told. Now, my second question is, were you one of the ambassadors who advised Liz Truss to tell the Russians to get troops out of Varenej and Rostov and Don? Oh. That's the second And my final question. I just, just want you to leave it just, there. Just, we still have a just couple very more. Short. I'd just like so, to know about um, Liz, Liz Truss. And the, the final question is, Boris oh. Johnson went to uh, Kiev while you were ambassador there. And the Ukrainians who were delegates at Istanbul say that he forced Zelensky to cancel the agreement they had for a ceasefire with Russia. What is your okay. question? Thank you. Thank you. And down the same row? Thank you. Excellent talk. Um, my question really is, so uh, what do you think the end game is going to be here? I'm thinking in part when Mark Milley at the end of 2022 was suggesting, you know, then was the time, you know, for the Ukrainians to seek some sort of a deal. And uh, this last year, 
is seen something of a bloodbath by any calculation. And some people think the casualties are maybe greater than in the Crimean War of the 1850s now. So that's my question, really. Where do we go for an end game to this? Thank you. And I think we'll take one last from the gentleman in the blue, because there's two gentlemen in the blue. Well, actually, that, that's pretty much my question. Uh, distasteful though it is to face up to it, is it not now inevitable that Crimea and, and parts of Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine rather, are going to end up being Russian? Thank you. Uh, so, um, so to your first question, it's actually your first two need to be directed at those who work on Russia in the Foreign Office and not at me, so I'm not going to answer them. And I'm not going to dignify your comment about Sergei Lavrov with a response. I don't think it's uh, it's uh, I don't think it's something I have the stomach for actually. But your third one about Boris Johnson, it wasn't all the people who went to Istanbul. It was one who then retracted it actually. Um, shortly afterwards, this question of whether Boris Johnson had forced the Ukrainians not to uh, continue uh, with the negotiation on peace. Um, and Boris Johnson said himself yesterday, was it, or two days ago? Uh, finally made clear that that was not what he had said. He had gone to, and I wasn't the ambassador inside um, Kiev, so actually it's the only prime minister visit that I wasn't present for because I'd been evacuated and I was in Warsaw. So unfortunately, um, I can't give you the chapter and verse because I wasn't in that room. And in fact, only Zelensky and Boris Johnson were in that room, um, as the picture shows. Um, uh, he says that, and he had intended to go there to be supportive, and he had encouraged them. Um, to um, do what they needed to do to defend their country. He had made clear in, was it yesterday's report, that he said that he had not um, told them uh, to do anything, frankly, because, and he still believes, and the UK believes, that whatever Ukrainians do for the future of their country has to be for Ukrainians to decide. I actually also think, from my own experience, that telling Ukrainians to do anything uh, is something that they take on advisement, but in the end will decide for themselves. So, uh, and in that respect, uh, any of our, you know, our prime minister or anyone else's prime minister would have met with the same response. As for the end game, it's an incredibly difficult conversation. I, uh, uh, I would have that conversation with Crimean Tatars about Crimea, whether, you know, what their hope was really for Crimea after the incursion, after the occupation. I couldn't find a Crimean Tatar who would um, rest on that even before the invasion and now, especially now, the idea that we all just give up and assume that we have a negotiation whereby Crimea becomes part of Russia. I've seen no change in that intent from them. Excuse me, I'm a Crimean Tatar. Ah, fine, okay. I'm absolutely thankful for your comments. Fine, okay. Fine, okay. Thank you. Um, but my point here is that in the end, your question about how this ends depends entirely on Ukrainian <laughs> will. Um, to keep their country together. And in the whole time that I was ambassador there, and in the time actually since I left when uh, Ukrainians are still in touch with me, I just see no change, even among those who uh, people claim are tired, and people are tired and they're pretty traumatized, but their intent and their determination hasn't changed at all in terms of what they uh, expect um, and what they want to happen with their country. So in that sense, it matters less what we think and more what Ukrainians are prepared to do. And as of now, there is no change in what Ukrainians are prepared to do. Mm. We'll take another round. I see the gentleman here. Um, uh, sorry, in the uh, right, right <coughs> row behind. Um, we'll start there and everyone have a think. Um, thank you. Thank you for this conversation. So uh, Ukraine is on, uh, on the path to membership in the European Union. Uh, let's hope it will materialize in the near future. What do you think will be the contribution of Ukraine to the new Europe which unfolds without Britain but with Ukraine? Well, it's hard to tell when you're outside the club. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, it's obviously, you're, you know, the UK isn't part of those conversations about... You know Ukraine. Uh, yes, I know Ukraine. It's harder to tell how that sits inside, uh, inside the EU. But, um, I, uh, it, I mean, it, the EU enlargement to the East has been a trajectory for a really long time, and there are other countries in that region who also want, uh, want membership. I think it's deeply interesting that Moldova is part of that mix, too, because it suggests... Not just, of course, that um, Maya Sandu has done a really good job of uh, lobbying and also of making clear that the war in Ukraine isn't just a matter for Ukraine, but is a security um, priority for the region. 
um, it indicates the EU continuing to take a regional approach when they think about the future of that um, expansion. So, you know, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe and massively resource rich and also stuffed full of really innovative tech nerds who know all about um, how you harness, give them anything, but at the moment it's military innovation. Um, for, for a cause that can then be transferred really well uh, across the European Union. They have a huge amount to contribute then, both in terms of agricultural um, commodities, but also in terms of knowledge, resource and IT. So uh, there's a net benefit there. Of course, um, this can take a really long time. And uh, the challenge for Ukraine, which has already got enough challenges, is that all the institutional strengthening and the governance journey I doubt that will go away, even in the face of more political will to, um, you know, to run that pre-accession path. There will still be uh, the same challenges around independent institutions and a strong judiciary and tackling corruption, etc. And this, if you like, I see as being the quid pro quo for Ukraine. They will, and um, I actually do believe that Zelensky is seized of that. He's done more for that uh, across those issues in the last kind of year than he did do in his first two years as president. So I think he can see that it needs to be part of that mix, but I don't uh, see it going away. So it, this is going to be a two-way thing on the one hand, um, defining exactly what it is um, that Ukraine is going to be a net, a net provider of to the EU, while at the same time making sure that they keep to the rules, rules of engagement for becoming a member. Mm. So um, we'll come to uh, Jeff and Gentlemen in the blue sweater, and then in the back in the black, and then um, I'll come here and then back there. So we'll go one, two, three. And Thank you. Just three. going back to the point about um, I was in Lviv uh, a, a few weeks ago and um, talking to a policeman. I was only talking to him because I had a minor car accident. But uh, in the in the business of trying to resolve my <laughs> slight predicament, I asked him what he's uh, what the general what he felt the, how long the war would last, uh, and they said five years. Um, so my question is, do you, do you think that that's about right as an assessment? Is that general what the public feel? And do you think Zelensky will still be there uh, in five years? Well, I'll take oh, a couple of this. Okay, fine. Sure. Uh, and then the woman in the black. Um, after you. Hi. I just had, a, I suppose, a straight diplomacy question around um, this situation seems to have called for some rather unconventional diplomacy, both I know that you were very active on social media and a bit more outspoken than is normal, but also from Ukraine, the way that they sort of went out to the world was unique and different. And I just wanted to get your comment on how diplomacy changed, particularly in the first year of the war. Um, yes, I have a question about how the conflict in Gaza and what's going on in Israel is going to impact um, the amount of resources and the attention um, that is now currently all devoted to Ukraine. So I'm kind of interested in broadening a bit the it's sort of geopolitical in terms of seeing the wider context and its impact on Ukraine. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's a general, uh, it's a general principle, unfortunately, borne out by every case study in history. That once a conflict like this explodes, then uh, you're looking at a long-term thing, and this is a 360-degree invasion. It, you know, not just military, but on every level, on disinformation, on hitting um, agricultural supplies, on abducting children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm afraid I too think that Ukrainians are in it for the longer term. I think it's quite a general um, statement because I, what I don't necessarily believe is that Ukrainians will fight a hot war for the next five years. I can see it having its peaks and troughs and taking different forms, but I can't see uh, a future in the short term where um, they can be in a meaningful negotiation that brings this to an end. So I think I agree with that policeman. Were you fined for the road accident? <laughs> Was you all right? <laughs> Right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, the unconventional diplomacy, you know what's funny actually is that ambassadors on social media is not unconventional at all. And when I did my ambassador training, um, there were all different courses you had to do, but one was a two week course on, you know, leadership, which was kind of how you run an embassy, etc. And one day was on media training and we were sent out with mobile phones to record 15 second videos and go on Instagram, etc. And some people were more comfortable with it than others. But um, most ambassadors at that point were on social media telling you about what they did. 
the difference was that it tended, um, by and large, to be quite general and quite formulaic. So you'd see the kind of obligatory shaking hands in front of a flag, or um, today I was in this interesting conference, but you don't get to hear what that was or what their view was. Um, I, I just went a few steps further. Mm. Quite, quite a few steps further, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and I was doing it before the, the uh, war. I just suddenly noticed that I didn't have that many followers before the war. I think I had something like 5,000 followers on Twitter. And then maybe a week after the invasion, I had 50,000 followers on Twitter. So, uh, of course, I realized if you have five to 50,000, you have a platform, you might as well use it. So, uh, and I also knew that it was going to be really difficult to get to Ukraine. And people were not traveling to Ukraine in that first three to four months um, not till after you know Boris Johnson made his first visit did other heads of state and government come. So I needed to be telling people what it was I was um, seeing, obviously, particularly after I left Poland. I'd only been in Poland for three, four weeks, and then I came back into Ukraine again. I saw it as the job of myself and my embassy to be bearing witness, to be telling people what was going on, to be able to do that as clearly as possible. So, you know, that was what I did. And I think I will never know if the Foreign Office was nervous about it. Uh, if they were, you know, it, it wasn't uh, ever really shared with me. There was some um, one horrible piece that came out uh, just before the invasion, actually, because I was starting to talk then uh, about how it felt um, in Ukraine. It was a massive piece of misogyny, kind of nasty piece of clickbait. And uh, I think perhaps I had colleagues in the Foreign Office who worried then that by being more open, I was making myself a target. Um, but I think any woman will tell you that if that's a reason to stop talking, mm -hmm. then, you know, you've really put yourself back 10 years. So uh, I didn't, and I continued to, to communicate. And then it became quite a useful, very accessible um, tool, informal tool for telling people about um, how the war was being experienced. And it's, um, I think it's probably helped to informalise the communication of some other um, heads of mission in other parts of the world. So in that sense, if it's had a bit of a transformational effect, I think that must only be a good thing. Um, as the Ukrainians, they were always brilliant at stratcoms. Stratcoms is, is one of many things that Ukrainians are absolutely brilliant at. One thing I remember about coming back into the country was that it was covered with wartime propaganda posters that had not been there when I'd left three weeks ago, and some of them were quite tongue-in-cheek and funny, which is extraordinary, right? Tanks had just rolled to Kiev, and Ukrainians were still capable of humor uh, about the war. It was quite extraordinary. Or there were... Um, QR codes, well, Ukrainians had QR codes long before we'd understood how to use QR codes. I mean, you can only order food in most Kiev restaurants with a QR code now. It's still being given menus in most restaurants in London. So in terms of tech, the Ukrainians have been ahead for a long time. It's not really surprising then that they would have been able to corral themselves to find innovative ways of, uh, of sharing their story. So um, I, just, I just thought that was a kind of, it just represented a great opportunity for people to see how how boss Ukrainians were uh, at doing that kind of thing. Um, and then for the uh, conflict in Gaza, I mean, uh, I'm sure, though I can't tell you for sure, of course, because I haven't been there for the last five, six months, there can be no question that, um, you know, there's a tension in terms of how military resources being made available. But what it hasn't done at all is shaken the resolve of Ukraine's allies and those uh, statements of support continue and they continue publicly. Blinken said what he said the other day about staying strong. David Cameron made uh, the point clearly after he was appointed. You get no sense that there's less bandwidth politically to be thinking about Ukraine because of Gaza. It'll be more, you know, what have you got and how do you make it uh, available? And I think that's quite heartwarming. I mean, there are stronger words to use, but quite frankly, when I was listening out, as many of you must have been, for those, uh, for those statements, it was really, really important they were said and very, very good that they were said. And I also think it's, uh, Zelensky is probably quite seized of it because you see he's traveling again. He was in Estonia, he was in Lithuania, uh, and he is very, very good at those travels, but he clearly sees the need uh, to be out there reminding people mm -hmm. uh, of the state of the invasion in Ukraine. And it's really good, I believe, that he's doing that. Great. We'll take um, a couple more questions. I know there were two right together in the aisle there by the mic and one also right next to them. So we'll take those three. Uh, I'd be curious to know how um, relationship, uh, like the relations between Ukrainian and Russian people evolved um, between when you arrived in Ukraine and now, as they were very close people. So, yeah. And uh, what happened to the Russians living in uh, Ukraine and how Ukraine handled that? <coughs> Mike. <coughs> My question was, uh, do you think it's realistic for Ukraine to officially join the European Union 
whilst an agreement to stop the war has not been signed. Thank you so much. Um, what do you think about the prospect of elections? I know they have been um, postponed and it's very complicated to organize elections in that, that context. But if there were um, drugs on five years or more, um, what should happen mm -hmm. with Zelensky being still the president or there should be another change of government somehow and how? Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, the, I suppose the one quite cataclysmic shift that I noticed in terms of Russian-Ukrainian relations is, um, and it's quite desperate really, is when Ukrainians were phoning their Russian relatives, telling them what was going on inside Ukraine, and Russian relatives were saying, well, we don't believe it. That was um, crushing for so many people. I have colleagues in the embassy with them. Most Ukrainians will know people you know, who live on Russian territory, and um, there were many stories of um, relationships just being torn apart by that, um, willful or otherwise, um, understanding about what was going on inside Ukraine. I can't tell you what was happening to Russian um, citizens because inside Kiev, uh, every Russian citizen left a week before I did. Actually, it was one of the really interesting things um, that we noted was that suddenly we were seeing quite a lot of Russian uh, number plates inside Kiev as, uh, as Russian diplomats were being clearly given the instruction to uh, gather their families and leave. So once that happened, um, you didn't see them. And um, uh, Russian speakers elsewhere, it wasn't clear really whether they had stayed where they were or moved back to Russia. Uh, and traveling to those places where, um, where there were a majority was quite difficult to, to do. But I cannot imagine that um, Russian citizens were going to stay where places were being pounded. So um, that's as much as I, uh, as much as I know um, about them. Um, Joining the EU, I, uh, I, I'm actually an optimist about it, which doesn't mean I don't think it will take a long, long time, but I, I, uh, I do think that Ukraine is going to be able to join the EU. And I, talking about unconventional diplomacy, the question for the back, the more extraordinary thing is not the public communications, it's the speed at which um, we have moved towards pre-accession talks for Ukraine and Moldova, and NATO deciding that they're going to dispense with the membership action plan, which, by the way, doesn't mean that I think Ukraine is going to join NATO anytime soon. But I spent a lot of time, along with um, other ambassadors in, 19, in 2019 and 20, lobbying for that membership action plan to be accorded to Ukraine. That was an absolutely massive campaign to um, get that done with opposition from Hungary at the time. Uh, and it was done, and it was a huge thing. We were all just really glad that they'd advanced another sort of tiny step along that road. And now you're in a situation where... Um, that step um, is being done away with as a way of sort of keeping that principle of joining open. So uh, I don't necessarily think it um, changes the path for Ukraine's membership eventually of the EU. But of course, it's also a huge, potentially quite a significant financial burden if you, uh, if you progress that path at a time when Ukraine is still at war. So I can see there being um, milestones and way marks along the way that may perhaps not exist. For, um, for other candidates, although we wouldn't know, would we, because so few candidates have actually joined over the last kind of 10 years as to make it um, hard to compare. But uh, I am optimistic about Ukraine joining the EU. <laughs> um, and um, on elections, so this is a really hard one to judge. I think it seems clear to me that Zelensky would like elections, and of course, democratically, there really should be at some point, he's at his five-year term, etc. but equally hard to see how you can achieve that. It's not just because, you know, for the sake of democracy, but the idea of how you can try to facilitate an election for all those people who are outside the country and all those people who are fighting and just create a process whereby it could be done safely. I actually think it's more likely that uh, the administration would be looking at um, ways to govern over the next period than uh, to be trying to um, create... Uh, no, it's no good. I can't finish the sentence because I just can't see it. How do soldiers vote safely in a way that um, uh, can then be third party verified and made sure that it was not corrupt, etc., and that you know it was transparent and so on? How you do that, I can't see a way to do it. So I think it's more likely that uh, Zelensky and his team, and I can't tell you because, of course, I'm not there, but that they would be having conversations about how then you create some form um, of governable scenario. Um, between now and the time where you judge that you can um, set up a system whereby you can reach the millions who are outside the country and be able to reach those <coughs> who are fighting 
so that they can participate in the process? I know that's a really unsatisfactory answer to that question, but I think it's a really hard question for the government to answer. And there's a part of me that feels bad, actually, that since they're still fighting this hot war and they're still taking these heavy losses, they have nonetheless to think about this. It's quite a burden and it's quite a pressure uh, to put on an administration that has you know, a very, very big thing to be dealing with elsewhere, but they do have to deal with it. Is there any last final question for the ambassador? I see one hand here and one hand here, so we'll take those two, um, we'll take those last three and we'll keep them, please, very brief. Um, so up there in uh, the back corner and we'll make our way down. Um, thank you to both of you for that talk. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I did want to ask a little bit more about the question asked earlier as to how Ukrainian culture has sort of sustained itself slash, um, you know, fought back during this. Thank you. Okay, um, the second hand was uh, here, if you just... So uh, my question would be, do you believe that um, in the case where um, Donald Trump could win the national, uh, current national election in the US, um, it would guarantee Russian victory in the war? Okay, so the question was if Trump won the, wins the US election. Yeah. Sorry, oh yes, I'll, just, I'll, I'll repeat for the audio. Um, if Trump wins the election, would that guarantee a Russian victory in the war? Thank you. I, if I could um, ask uh, Dame Linda to um, respond to the very rich, complex <laughs> questions in, a, in just a minute or two, and then we'll wrap things up. Thank Lord. you. Lord. Okay. All right. I'll try to do that. <laughs> uh, so uh, I actually think the response to the uh, attack on Ukrainianness inside Ukraine has, has been extraordinary because Ukrainian culture has exploded. And uh, this is another thing that, that globally has has. Where, where global intervention has helped because in so many countries, Ukrainian culture has been given a platform and they have seized it with both hands and it's been extraordinary and you can see it from, and I am going to mention the Eurovision because <laughs> it's so cool that Ukraine won the Eurovision Song Contest and he auctioned his pink hat for hundreds of thousands of dollars and then that money went to the you know, armed forces and then there was an explosion of interest in, uh, in that band and then other bands and more platforms created for Ukrainian music. Uh, I... Um, in, inside Kiev, when I went back, I thought it was extraordinary that the staging of productions and the showing of films and, and things, there were so many more of them. It's just where you had to go. So you didn't go to cinemas anymore to see films. You didn't go to concert halls. I must have been to at least three performances on Kreshchatik Underground Station on the platform. That was often where you went to hear music or see things. And then the Kiev Railway Station um, would host things quite often. I felt a little bit more nervous about, but I would still go. They felt like solidarity events. You went along not just to kind of, I don't know, two fingers up and bombing. It wasn't really that crude. It was more where people were going to gather and uh, demonstrate really what it was to be Ukrainian. Then you were going to go along and hear it. But I think actually the bigger impact was that Ukrainian culture, um, manifestations of it, reached so many more countries. In fact, I don't know how well known this is, but uh, the first year of the invasion was the UK-Ukraine season of culture. I was, I was the chair of that advisory board when it started. I mean, it was crushing. We had all these events planned that were going to be in Ukraine and we had to cancel them all. But what was so fantastic was that we made the decision with the Prish Council that, OK, we couldn't do this in Ukraine, but we would do it in the UK. So that half of it, that was going to happen. And all the resource that was going to be for both was then targeted at bringing Ukrainians over to all different parts of the UK. They were in Sheffield, they were in Nottingham, they were uh, all around the country showing films or they were doing readings, and poetry, and dance, etc. Really quite amazing. And I should say that I do think there's a direct relationship between that and a wall full of Ukrainian language books at Foils. An increased awareness of, uh, uh, of what it is to be Ukrainian has increased the interest in learning the language. What was it Dmitry Kuleba said? It took the war for people to truly understand just how cool Ukrainians were. I do, uh, I believe that. Um, if Trump wins, it's going to be... Uh, harder but it's really hard to judge how much harder until we're in that world and we're not in that world yet so let's see but i can't comment on on something quite so binary as whether it guarantees a russian victory i think we can only comment on what we've seen so far which is uh european union stepping up and talking about how um it uh plays a greater role in that space and lots more conversations about um defense manufacturing to try to fill that gap and in the meantime most extraordinary story in the Times that um, the Ukrainians themselves have manufactured so many drones that the Ukrainians don't have the procurement budget to buy them all. So now we might find ourselves in a weird situation where Ukraine is actually selling that technology while they're fighting a war. So there's a, there, there are the important conversations happening, I can see right now, about what that world looks like. 
but I, uh, I don't think you can comment right now what that means. I think what we can comment freely on is that it's clearly a scenario that Putin thinks would work for him. But, you know, there were lots of scenarios since February 22 that Putin thought would work for him and uh, have not played out that way. So, um, so let's see how the international community comes good. Um, and then finally, the abduction of children and how we stop it. My answer to that is a really boring one, because the issue with um, those media interviews, etc., is that you have one piece and everyone goes, oh, no, rape. And then there's a kind of thing and then it goes away. So the boring answer, I'm afraid, relates to my own New Year's resolution I made for myself, which was only one, which was to stay strong. That was my resolution. I think that 24 is going to be hard, really hard for Ukrainians, and I think that 25 will be too. And there is only one thing that any supporter of Ukraine has to do, which is to stick with it. We have to stick with it. And that means doing the same things over and over again. And in the context of what is happening to those children, or what's happening to those women or girls, what's really going on in Donetsk or Luhansk or Crimea or Kherson, frankly, is to keep telling those stories in whatever media we're using in our social media for those journalists to keep coming, to keep active, to work harder to create the spaces for those narratives to be heard. And you won't have something new to tell apart from that it's happening to more people, but it's a net negative if you decide you've told it and you don't need to talk about it anymore. It's not a net neutral. So you have to go back in there and you have to keep creating moments like this where we can talk about it. That is what I think has to be done. Great. Thank you so much. an incredibly rich conversation and I think ending on the resolution to stay strong I can't imagine a better note to end on um, before we close I'd just like to remind you our next po uh, policy and practice event is next Thursday it's uh, Israel Palestine what's happening and what's next um, UCL students and staff can sign up for that online that one is only available for UCL students and staff the recording will be posted later um, if you don't already, please follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle is UCLSPP. You can keep up with the latest events. Thank you again for joining us, and please thank, join me once again in thanking our speakers. Thank you.